going to have to fix that. Well, church, we've been doing uh, the last couple weeks on prayer. We're going to close our third week on prayer here this morning. And it's been a good conversation, I feel like, we've been having about prayer, talking about instances of prayer, why do we pray, when did Jesus pray, how did Jesus pray, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, it's interesting to talk and to have these discussions about prayer because I find that I am reminded in these moments that prayer is not typically my first instinct when things go bad or when things go wrong. My first thought isn't necessarily, oh boy, I better pray about it. My first solution tends to be, oh boy, I better solve this problem that's in front of me. There's some sort of challenge I'm facing, there's some sort of issue I'm facing in my life, and my instinct tends to be, oh no, I better fix this. And it's interesting, having spent these last couple weeks on prayer, that I've been challenged in that recently to say, okay, me trying to fix all of my problems just may not be the best solution there is out there. Listen, I'm a big fan of me. I think I'm great. I think I have lots of answers. I am generally wrong about that assessment of myself, but I like to think that it's true. But the truth is, is that prayer, in and of itself, can be an answer to our issues, even when we don't get the answer we're looking for. You see, prayer, in and of itself, is an exercise that reminds us where God fits and where we fit. Where we fit. That's nice. I'm a hobbit now. Um, where God fits and where we fit. You see, just the moment of stopping in the middle of a problem, stopping in the middle of an issue and acknowledging that somebody else is in control, that somebody else is in charge, is holy. <coughs> and can be a source of peace, if you will let it. You know... This is sort of, I like to compare it to sometimes running on a treadmill. You know, not that I have a ton of experience running on a treadmill, but I'll speak from other people's experiences. When you run on a treadmill, you don't get very far. In fact, you don't get anywhere. All you get is into the one place that you hopped on the treadmill on. Unless you're extremely clumsy, and then sometimes you end up five feet behind the treadmill. But you rarely land any place forward when you're on the treadmill. And so, if you're looking at a treadmill, and you're hopping on the treadmill, thinking, I'm going to see the world by hopping on this treadmill, you have missed the point of the treadmill. Sometimes, when we pray, we think, I'm going to get the answer I want out of God, and that's why, that's why I'm praying. And in that, we have missed the point of prayer altogether. You see, you can run on a treadmill for days and your view will never change. But that does not make the process of running on a treadmill invaluable. It, it, does, it doesn't make the process of running on a treadmill just a complete worthless waste of time. <coughs> you see, as you run on the treadmill, you train your body. You get fit, you burn calories, you grow your stamina, you increase your muscle, you do, and you certainly increase your cardio stamina, you do all sorts of things while running on the treadmill, even if you don't necessarily get to see a beautiful view of the country. But if the only thing you're after in running is to get a beautiful view of the country and you hop on a treadmill, you're going to be slowly <coughs> disappointed. It's the same way with prayer. If the only reason we ever pray is to get a specific answer to a need out of God, then frequently we will experience disappointment. Because frequently, we will not get the answer that we have looked for. <coughs> Which stinks. I don't like that part. Wish I could have edited that part out of this morning, right? I wish I could stand up here and say, if you pray... 
God will do exactly what you want every time. I wish I could say that. I can't, because that would be lying, and I'm really not supposed to do that up here. They frown upon that. They, they teach you that in 101 classes. They don't stand up there and lie. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that that is the end solution of prayer, that you're going to get everything you want. But I can tell you this, that the end solution of prayer will be you having your needs met by God. I can promise that. I can promise you that at the end of sincere prayer, in sincere seeking of God, you will experience more and deeper peace than you did before. Maybe not immediately, but down the road, in a moment, in the times when we can step back and contemplate, you will experience deeper and greater peace. And because of that, prayer is valuable beyond just the Google of it all. Beyond just the I type my need into the search engine and then it spits results back at me. In the peace, in the relationship building, in the growing of one's faith, there is value. But you see, in addition to that, prayer isn't just this idea that I say things to God all the time. Prayer isn't just a monologue where I call God up on the phone and he puts me on speakerphone while he's doing other stuff and I just talk for hours and hours and hours. And God might be doing his sewing or cooking dinner, or fixing the car, I'm not really entirely sure, but whatever he's doing, he can just put me on speakerphone because he knows I'm never going to ask his opinion. He knows I'm never going to let him get a word in that twice. Do you have a friend like this? Do you have someone in your life like this that you talk to on the phone, or you have a conversation with your head, or you have dinner, and you silently sit there and wonder and go, I wonder if they noted, if they would notice if I was raptured right now. If I disappeared, and it was just a shell of my clothes laying here on the back of this booth, would the person I'm sitting across from even notice that I'm gone, or would they just continue their story? I have friends like this. I have people in my life like this that just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and, talk. and if I'm not careful, I can be one of those people who just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks, especially when I'm upset. When somebody has wronged me, or something has happened that I'm mad about, I can call somebody, especially my brother, I can call him and go, you're never going to guess what happened to me today. <laughs> this happened to me, and I can't remember exactly what the incident I was upset about, so clearly it was a big deal. I can't remember it, it was like a couple weeks ago, and I'm already over it. And so I call him, and I'm talking, and I'm just ranting, and just going on, I can't believe that this is what happened, and you're never going to guess what happened next, and this is the thing that happened, and then this thing happened, and you're never going to believe what happened. And I found out like 10 minutes later that the phone had disconnected, <laughs> that the call had dropped, and I have no idea how long ago it had dropped, maybe 5, 10 minutes along the way. I had been talking to just absolutely no one, and never noticed. Because I didn't require a response from him. No, I just wanted to talk. I do this all the time. Back and forth with him. He'll call me and he'll be mad about something and he'll be ranting and raving and I'll be in the middle of something or, or I'll be here and somebody will come in and I'll just press that little mute button on my iPhone and so he can't hear me and I'll just have a conversation with somebody. He'll still be going on and on and they'll go, oh, who is that? I go, oh, that's just my brother. Don't mind him. He's just talking. And then at some point, if he stops talking or stops taking a breath, I'll unmute it and go, wow, yeah. And then just mute it back and just go back to whatever I was doing. He doesn't need me to participate in this conversation. And so many of us, our attitude towards prayer is the same thing. So many of us, we call God up and we go, you're never going to guess what happened to me today, Lord. It started like this, and it started like that, and then this happened, and that happened, and all of this stuff is going wrong in my life, and so here's what I need. I need this, that, and the other, and I need you to solve all these problems. Amen. Click. And we never take a breath. We never take a moment. We never give God a chance to get a word in edgewise. You know, so many of us, we say, I wonder why I don't hear the voice of God. I wonder why, I, why, what is God saying to me? I wish I knew what direction God was giving to me. 
And yet, we never give them a word in edgewise when we're in conversation with them. You know, prayer is more than just talking. There is a listening component of prayer that can be very difficult to practice. Nothing about our lives, nothing about our culture encourages pause, encourages stopping, ever. In fact, most of the way that our culture has been built is to say, do as much as you can, as fast as you can. And so we have found a way to streamline everything. We have made everything faster. Think of all the stuff you can do in your car now. I can get in my car. I can make phone calls and do all this kind of stuff. Then I can pay my bills over the phone while I'm driving. And then while I'm doing that, I can pull through the fast food and then I can eat while I'm paying my bills on the phone while I'm driving and hope I don't, you know, drive the car into a lake or something. I, of course, I know I'm not going to drive the car into my lake because while I'm paying my bills on the phone, while I'm eating, while I'm driving my car, my car is telling me the directions that I ought to be going. You see, we are a culture that worships efficiency. Think, how can I do this? I don't want to spend 10 minutes to bake a potato. I want to put it in the microwave. Who takes 10 minutes to bake a bit? I don't want to spend the time making dough to make cookies. I just want the tear and bake cookies. Are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. You know, they have these places, they don't have any around here yet, but they have these places in, uh, I, I saw one in Toronto, and they have in bigger cities where there's sushi restaurants, but the sushi comes around on a conveyor belt. So all you do is you go in and you sit down, and you don't even have to order. You don't even have to wait for the guy to make it. He's already making it before you get there. All you have to do is come in and sit down and wait for the food to literally pass underneath your nose, and you can pull it off the conveyor belt and eat it. What a world. We are a culture that worships efficiency, and that has rejected the idea of waiting and pausing. And yet, when we talk about prayer, when we talk about relationship with God, it is in those moments of waiting and pausing that we meet God. We're going to kick at Old Testament again here this Sunday, even though that series is over. And we're going to be in 1 Kings 19, and we're going to tell the story of Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, and this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. So uh, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. So Elijah has defeated all the prophets of Baal, all the prophets that Ahab and Jezebel have sent. And she says, Okay, uh, I'm going to kill you now. And I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. You have 24 hours. Okay. So the night, verse 3 starts with this. Elijah was afraid. That seems like an appropriate response to that kind of threat. And ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And so this is the first example of prayer we see in this story. It doesn't go well. Elijah comes, and he's being chased, and he's being chased, and he knows that they are trying to kill him, and he lays down on the bush and says, Lord, just <laughs> let me die. And then he goes to sleep. I've had bad days. I don't know that I've ever actually prayed before, just let me die. But that's where Elijah's at. That's where Elijah's at. He's still in this mode of Talk, talk, talk prayer. Um, Lord, let me die. Amen. I'm going to bed. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. 
He ate and drank and then laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And so this is, there's another interesting picture here. So Elijah prays to the Lord and he says, Lord, let me die, and goes to bed. The angel of the Lord wakes him up. And there's bread. He eats, he drinks, he goes to bed. The angel of the Lord wakes him up again and says, eat, because the journey will be too much for you. And I think it's funny that the first example of prayer we get in this story is unanswered prayer. Elijah says to the Lord, Lord, let me die. And God says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the opposite of that. And what happens instead is the Lord meets his need, his physical need. And then the Lord gives him purpose. Church, I contend to you this this morning. That sometimes the best responses we get from the Lord are the prayers he doesn't answer like we want him to. Are the times the Lord says, no, I have something else for you. No, I have something better for you. And part of that is this. You know, I'm one person, and I see from one person's perspective. I can look around in this room, and I can see the back of the room, and I can see the front of the room, and I can see all over this room, and I have a pretty good shot of this room, and if I stand up here, I have an even better shot of this room. I might have better perspective on this room than anybody else in this room. I can see everything. I can see all of this room. But I can't see into the fellowship hall. I can't see into the pavilion. I can't see down the street to the mire. I have one person's perspective on any given situation. And because of that, <clears throat> I can't always be trusted to make the best decisions. You know, I, there was a video game that came out, oh gosh, probably about 15 years ago now. It's called The Sins. And what happens is you have these little people and you control their lives. And I know what you may be thinking. You may be thinking, oh, this, who would spend their time doing that? Well, the answer to that question is me. I would spend my time doing that. It became very obsessive and very addictive because these little guys, they have their own lives and they fall in love and they go to work and they have their whole thing. But in this game, you are sort of like a godlike figure and you click on these people and you tell them where to go and you tell them what to do and all this kind of stuff. And so what happens more often than not is these sims, these little characters, they have needs that they need met. <clears throat> and so they're hungry and they have to sleep and they have to go to the bathroom, and they have to do all of these things. But they refuse to meet their needs on their own. They just won't do it. And so, if you wait long enough, and you don't click on your sim, and tell him to go get food, he will starve to death. He will just stand there and starve to death. If you don't tell him to go to the restroom, he will eventually go to the restroom, whether it be at work or in public or in the middle of the living room or while having a dance party, God only knows. And it's so interesting because the game is so frustrating. Because you look at these little guys and you go, if you would just do what you need to do, your lives would be fine. I don't even need to be here. But instead, I constantly have to click on you and tell you to go all over here and meet your needs. And if you just understood what I saw, if you could just see what I see, and you know that you could go to, you could do this, and then you could do this, and then as soon as you get home from work, you're going to do this, and it ends up being more frustrating of a process than it really is anything else. And it makes you take a step back and go, oh my gosh, is this the way the Lord sees me? Is constantly running around, running myself into walls, unable to lead and guide my own life, where the Lord looks at me and goes, if you could just see what I see, and know what I know, you would understand why this is happening. And so what the Lord is saying to Elijah in, in this passage of Scripture, and it's what the Lord is saying to us. If you could just see what I see and know what I know, you would understand why this is happening. 
in this next passage of scripture, it says, Elijah's in a cave, and it says this, And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I'm zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. It says this, Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. The Lord says to Elijah to look for my voice and to listen for my voice, and there is wind, and there is an earthquake, and there is fire, and the Lord is not in them. There is noise all around us. There is disaster and tragedy all around us. And so many of us, we spend our time going, what could this mean? What does this mean? What does this earthquake mean? What does this hurricane mean? What do these wildfires say? What is God trying to say? What is God punishing us for? We look into our own lives and we see these sorts of moments and tragedies and we say, God, what are you punishing me for? God, what are you trying to tell me? And this passage says, the Lord is not in the fire, he's not in the earthquake, he's not in the wind. The Lord is in the small whisper. The gentle whisper. In church, if we are not ready to hear the gentle whisper, we will miss the voice of God. If we spend our time obsessed with the wind and the fire and the earthquakes of life, we will miss the gentle whisper of God. You see, Elijah had experienced quite a bit by this point. He'd been, had his life threatened, and he'd been sent to this place, and he'd been promised the voice and the presence of God, and he'd seen all this crazy stuff go on around him. But he had to be ready to hear the Lord and not just the wildness that circled around him. Elijah had to have the faith that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. See, I, I find in, in life that faith is a lot like, you know, homeowner's insurance. Everybody has it, but nobody wants to use it. You know, I'm so glad I have faith, I'm so glad I have faith, but Lord, please don't ever make me exercise my faith. Lord, please don't ever make me prove that I trust you. Please don't ever make me prove that I believe in you. Please don't ever make me prove that you are actually in control and Lord of my life. I would much rather fold up my faith like my little homeowner's insurance certificate and keep it in the security box in the basement and never, ever, 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 ever have to pull it out or worry about it or call that number. For church, that's just simply not how faith works. Any of us who believe for even a short amount of time know that. We know that faith <coughs> is tested, is challenged. Faith is an active verb. It says, will you believe me not just when things are good? Will you believe me not just when things are easy? Will you believe me not just when everything works? Will you believe me in the wind, in the fire, in the earthquake? Will you believe me when everything is falling apart? And will you be ready to hear my voice? Church prayer is... 
is essential to the life of a believer, and an essential part of prayer is being willing to stop and say, Lord, what are you saying? Lord, what do you have for me? It's not just saying, Lord, this is what I want, this is what I need, Lord. This is how I think I need to proceed in this situation. And saying, Lord, what do you have for me? What do I need to hear? What do you want? Elijah prays in the situation, he prays, Lord, let me die. That's how he starts this story. And this is a terrible story if God gives him what he wants. This is the worst story ever. I'm not preaching out of this passage that the Lord gives him what he wants. If this passage ends with Elijah laying down on the tree saying, Lord, let me die, and then he dies, that's awful. That's terrible. You can't cook a sermon out of that. The catalyst for all of the things that Elijah is going to do in his future is the idea that God doesn't answer his prayer. That God says no, and it sets him on a path to be one of the foundations of our faith. One of the, one of the fathers of the reason why we believe what we believe today is God saying no. And instead saying, if you will listen to me, if you will trust me, if you will have faith in me, I will lead you to a place that in this moment, you don't have the perspective to see. In this moment, when Elijah is being chased and he's being threatened and they're threatening for his life, he does not have the perspective to see the victory that God is going to give him in the future. In church, in our lives, we are in the midst of of threats when we are in the midst of difficult situations. We do not have the perspective to see the victory that God is going to give us, but it doesn't mean we won't achieve that victory if we have faith, if we hold on, and if we are apt to listen to the voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But you will never see that victory if you can't learn to access that faith, if you can't learn to say, I will survive the wind and the earthquake and the fire and wait for the gentle whisper of God. It's not easy. It's very difficult. It's super difficult. And it doesn't require that every moment of your life you go, no, this is going to be fine. God's got it. It doesn't, it doesn't require that you be super valley of man and just respond to every situation and just say, everything is fine. Everything is peaceful. Everything is wonderful. That's not real life. That's not how anybody lives their life. That's certainly not how I live my life. If anything, I am super need a valley of man. I'm the one that responds and goes, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? What is going to happen? What is going on here? What is happening? Oh my goodness. And I it just pace around and I talk and I talk to myself and I throw my hands around and I knock stuff off the shelves because I'm gesticulating so wildly because I can't solve this problem. And in the meantime, God is in heaven looking down, going, if you could just see what I see, if you just knew what I know, He's not impatient with me. He's not mad at me. He's not frustrated with me. He's not kicking me. You know why? Because he sees what we can't. And he knows what we don't. And he knows the end of the story. He's not frustrated with you. He's not mad at you. He sees the end of the story. He knows it's going to work out. He knows there is a plan and purpose for your life. He's not worried about it. It's not easy. And it's not going to be easy. It's a learned behavior. Because it flies in the face and in conflict of everything that is our instinct. Everything that is our, in our brain and in our hearts that says, oh my goodness, I have to fix everything. And yet, 
it is the solution. It is the way forward. We're going to sing the doxology here. And as we do, we're going to try something different. You know, I practice these sermons, and I put together these sermons every week. And I always think, what's a button I can put at the end of these sermons? What's a little something I can say that people will walk out and take with them and it'll mean something to them, and hopefully they'll hold on to it beyond just the 10 seconds after they walk out of the sanctuary. And I work on this, and I develop this, and it's sort of that. And so this week I was doing that, and I thought, you know what? I thought, it, that's totally counterintuitive to everything I'm going to spend the 20 minutes before that saying. I don't want to put a button on what we're talking about this morning. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing the doxology, and we're going to take a moment, and we're going to be still. We're going to be quiet. And we're going to take a moment and listen for the whisper of God in our own hearts, in our own spirit. Because I don't take enough time in my life to do it. I know most people don't take enough time in their life to do it. And more important than anything I could say, more important than any button I could try and put, more important than any nice conclusion sentence I could try and put on this one, <clears throat> is simply the voice of God and the voice of peace in your life bringing you what it is that you need, what it is that you ask for, what it is that you are looking for, bringing in what it is that God has for you this morning. So we're going to sing, we're going to take a moment, and then I'm going to pray and we're going to be dismissed. Father God, we're, we're grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your voice. We're grateful for these moments to hear the gentle whisper of God, to meet our need, to lead us into a purpose that is greater than our perspective, and to send us into places we never thought we could go, simply because we believe and we trust. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you all.